They are the kings of the Australian outback. You've got to concentrate all the time. Some of the biggest trains in the world. Things go wrong with these things. It normally makes a big mess. On epic journeys through a hostile continent. I don't know what we're going to do. Just slow down and blow the horn. A nation depends on them. All good, boys. Get into it. And the teams that keep these metal monsters on the tracks. Yeah. Hauling huge loads of food, freight and mineral riches across incredible distances. We are out in the middle of nowhere, that's for sure. Big trains. Big country. Railroad Australia, a 13,000 horsepower super train. That's what lies ahead of us, the mountains. Up against the mountain range from hell. We get paid big bucks for this one. Danger on the tracks. Oh, here we go. How do you stop a 5,000 ton juggernaut? Farmers moving a whole herd of sheep over the track and we've come along with 110 and wiped out half this herd. And the outback heroes. Oh. With train troubles. Main air pressure's dropping up and down a little bit. And a showdown with one of the locals. Early morning at the Port Botany docks in Sydney. The last containers are coming off a freight train that arrived overnight, bringing thousands of tonnes of produce from inland New South Wales. The minute the last container is off, the race is on to get the train ready for the difficult return journey. From the Sydney docks, up and over the Great Dividing Range, to its home depot in Dubbo, 500 kilometres away. The name stamped on the train belongs to this man, Roger Fletcher. He used to lease trains to pick up containers from his sheep farm and freight depot. But a year ago, took the plunge and bought his own locomotives. A multi-million dollar punt he hopes will pay off. We're a family company that started from scratch. I only started with a couple of thousand sheep on the road and we just built the thing up. We're not a multinational, but we try and keep control of what we got. His workers are racing to fill containers with bulk meat, wheat, cotton seed and other produce to sell to the world market. It has to be done before the train arrives from Sydney. But lying between the train and the depot are these. The spectacular Blue Mountains are known for their wild beauty. But for trains, they're a killer. Some of the steepest grades and sharpest curves in the country. Lose an engine on the relentless mountain climb and you're in trouble. It will take three locomotives, each with more than 4,000 horsepower to do the job. Things go wrong with these things, it uh, normally makes a big mess. Shunt driver John O'Tiernan... I'm just checking the compressor oil. ...has to make sure they're fit and ready for action. These trains here go a long distance, hauling heavy loads, so, um, yeah, we check these every day. It's all good. Looking good there, mate. Three wagons go now, mate. Three. Roger. Ready to go. After the engine check, Jono and his shunting partner, Andrew Brick, known as Bricky, have to put the train together. Three metres. Just a one metre. And red light. Right, mate. That's a red light there. Three-step protection in place. Shunting is one of the most dangerous operations on the railway. Those locomotives weigh 134 tonne each. Keep it coming, Jono. 
If something does roll away, it goes wrong because you've turned a blind eye to something or not follow through on all safety aspects, yeah, fatalities do happen. Air brakes have to be disconnected. It has a lot of uh, air pressure in it. And if you just unhook it, it flies everywhere, takes your shins out, anything else, knees, stuff you really do need. Right, mate, you're away. Fantastic. Jono and Bricky have assembled a whopping 62 wagon train. That's over one and a half kilometres in length. Now it's time to take on the mountain. From Sydney down to Adelaide, where a freight train is about to trek over two and a half thousand kilometres across the continent to Perth. Transcontinental freighter 3MP9 started its journey in Melbourne, headed west to Adelaide, and will now cross the great wilderness of the Nullarbor Plain to the Western Australian capital. Nice day for it. And, uh, yeah, well, hopefully we get there in two and a half days. Cookie is one of four drivers. For the next 32 hours, he and the others will live and work on the train. When they're not up front in the loco, home is the crew car where they eat and sleep. This is the box. Uh, we carry all our stuff in, like, just for, uh, for the trip. We're pretty good cooks, aren't we? Yeah, we're fantastic cooks. Yeah. Just quietly. Don't tell, them, don't tell our wives. Yeah, don't tell our wives. <laughs> On this mammoth 5,000 kilometre round trip, they're going to need to carry their own fuel, and lots of it. About 52 to 53,000 litres of fuel. There are no bridges, tunnels or roads where they're going. So the train can be double-sized upwards. Containers stacked on top of each other like Lego. At six metres high, these boxcars are some of the biggest in the world. They're twice the size of an average boxcar. They're the same length, they're just at twice the height so that they can get twice as much. You get 72 pallets in there. The double decking operation is fast and efficient. The locomotives and wagons on this train are worth $25 million. The cargo, another $2 million. That's a lot of money. And there's a tight deadline for loading. We have a window of three hours to turn it around to get it out. The last wagons of 3MP9 are ready to be shunted onto the rest of the train. By the time it makes its mega journey across the Nullarbor, it will be towing 72 wagons a train that measures nearly 1.8 kilometres, the equivalent of 18 football pitches, double stacked, loaded to the maximum with food and other vital supplies for the distant city of Perth. We'll do an air test and then we'll uh, continue on to Perth. 3MP9 has been loaded on schedule and is on its way. It's a good start to a tough journey. Yeah, bang on time. But on this route, with two and a half thousand kilometres of desert wilderness ahead, anything can happen. Heading north to Almaden, 170 kilometres inland from Cairns, where the Savannah Lander is on day two of a four day trip to the old gold mining town of Forsyth on a unique journey that's always full of surprises. Drivers Will and Lee have already conquered a tropical mountain range in the rain, stopped to rescue an injured fruit bat, and had a near miss with a motorist. Welcome aboard the Savannah Lander, all those who just joined us, and welcome back to our regular South passengers. <laughs> The Savannah Lander and its passengers have spent the night in sleepy Almaden, a dusty one hotel town that still relies on this weekly service. The train is old and the tracks it's travelling on even older. The whole railway line was built to a really 
really minimal standard. Whatever the, the least amount of work that they can get away with is what they went with. The rails on this century-old line are light and uneven. You can visually sight down that, that you know one's higher than the other and there's, there's little kicks and dips in it all over the place. The terrain is hard and unforgiving. If there's a sign of trouble, now is the time to find it. If you're looking underneath, just if you see anything bright, shiny and silver, that's probably something that's wrong. So you have to look underneath. If everything's black and dirty, uh, everything's where it's supposed to be. It's an all clear for the 1960s train they call the Silver Bullet. Bullet! It's time for this Outback Classic to hit the rails. For Lee, it's going to be a tough day at the controls, but he wouldn't swap this job for anything. I mean, I've been doing this now for eight years and it's still different. Say good day to everyone in the morning and head off, it's good. I really like it. It's not long before the Savannah Lander hits the worst section of track. Lee's prediction of a rough ride is spot on. In this rugged country, there could be anything on the tracks. A spotter car that can drive on rails has been sent on ahead, looking for danger. He left Mount Surprise this morning pretty early, and he'll make his way across all the way to Forsyth. Um, and what he's doing is he's just checking, making sure there's no trees down, making sure there's no large rocks or landslides in the area. You can check for rocks and landslides out here but you can't predict the wildlife. Well, to your right. The Blue Mountains, rising from sea level to more than 1,000 metres. It's a tough place to put a railway line. But train drivers Simon Briggs and Mick Grantham have taken them on many times before. And that's what lies ahead of us, the mountains. With 1.2 kilometres of train dragging behind, these mountains are a huge test of man and machine. It will be a long and slow battle, more than 100 kilometres of winding track ahead. Some of the steepest grades trains this long can manage. We've started the climb. When we get to valley heights, the grade stiffens again, so it'll get steeper again. The engines are working a bit harder now. We're starting to wash off some of our speed. So we're currently in uh, notch eight, which is full throttle. And uh, we're doing 51 k's an hour, but de-accelerating at eight k's an hour a minute. So yeah, it's, it's a fairly steep climb up here for a little bit. Ahead is the first of a series of tunnels that help cut a path through the rocky terrain. The train's horn has to be sounded before they hit the darkness. A vital warning to workers who may be on the line. The tunnels are more than 100 years old, dark and damp. So one of the nicknames for them was the rat holes because it was like going in and out of a whole heap of little burrows. With visibility low, Simon and Mick have to be especially vigilant. One down. Nine to go. <laughs> the train is now deep into the range. It will take a punishing hour to break the back of the mountain pass. An hour at full throttle. Maximum pull. The three locos combined 13,000 horsepower is fully engaged as the train grinds its way to the summit. If it loses momentum here, it could be dragged down to stalling speed. Stop now and getting this monster started again will be a nightmare. From just west of Sydney down to South Australia, where freight train 3MP9 has left Adelaide. 
and is snaking its way westward. Bound for Perth, which is still two days away. With Cookie at the controls, slowly building the huge train up to its top speed of 110 kilometres per hour. After extra wagons were added for the Nullarbor crossing, it's now a colossal 1.8 kilometres long, weighing 5,000 tonnes. A giant of a train. Cookie's pushing it to maximum throttle when he gets a warning from train control. Yeah, train pick 9, um, 9112, just put in a man break creek. I've just reported there's a herd of sheep, quite a few of them. Um, looks like they're about to cross in there, mate, so just keep an eye on going through there. Is that might like be interesting, Cookie? Yeah. It's a farmer moving a herd of sheep, um, and he hasn't advised control, so he doesn't know that we're coming. He doesn't know there's any trains in the area. Uh, and a train we're crossing has reported it, so we just need to show a bit of caution. On a train this size, going this speed, stopping isn't an option. We've hit sheep before with that instance. Farmers moving a whole herd of sheep over the track and we've come along to 110 and wiped out half his herd. So, yeah, it's a little bit dangerous. Animals on the track are a common problem out here. Drivers have to deal with them nearly every shift. Cookie and Ryan passed the train that warned them about the sheep on the track. Cookies already dropped their speed down to under 70. But if the farmer hasn't got his sheep off the line by now, things could get messy. If we see him, hopefully be able to slow down before we hit him. The Savannah Lander is carving its way across the grasslands of the North Queensland outback, sharing the rails with the local wildlife. Well, to your right. It's when their fur touches the train and it starts getting close. Both Will and Lee used to be zookeepers. Wildlife is a, it's a huge part of my life. It's a passion, something that um, I've just had forever. I still get to talk about wildlife and educate a lot of the people on the train about it. It's just in this sense, the wildlife is out there. A few common, well, two common wallaroos on the right-hand side. There's time for one final close encounter. This time with humans. Before the Savannah Lander pulls into its destination of Forsyth. We we'll leave here at 8.30 in the morning. So be over here before then. It'll stay overnight here. But before it does, there's a local tradition that has to be observed. Yeah, we're going to have a ride on the train. <laughs> of course, we're going to let them come for a little bit of a, a trip around the angle with us. It only takes five, ten minutes max. Hey, who's that? Uh, but they love it. They're here every week. <laughs> yeah. Give them something to look forward to. Time to rest up, ahead of its 400 kilometre return journey. I'm heading back to Cairns. Take us two days to get there. Um, overnight tonight, Mount Surprise. It's a small train with a big reputation. And you're never too old to take a ride. Oh, what's on me? Yeah. Savannah Lander. Yeah. We've been dying to get on it. Dying to get on it? Oh, oh, I'm <laughs> Where's a bit of bloody wood for me to knock on with? <laughs> <laughs> Things could get interesting, you'll see. She's 95 years old, not bad. Yeah, well. <laughs> It may be the home run, but Lee and Will won't be coasting. Up ahead is one of the train's trickiest climbs. What we're doing is we're climbing out of Forsyth up the Newcastle Range, which is our highest point of the Savannah Lander trip. We're 
We do have a common Wallaroo on the bridge. Away he goes. Yeah, he's out of there. Hey, this part here is known as High Bridge, funnily enough. It's a little uncommon for us to have bridges this high out this far west. Most of the bridges that we're going to go over are quite low. These timber bridges are made from local trees felled more than 100 years ago. They're still standing strong, but need to be inspected every year for termites, which could weaken them. They're sturdy and stable, but Lee's taking no chances. It's a long way down to the rocks. From North Queensland, down to west of Sydney. Where the Fletcher's freight train has finally climbed to the top of the Blue Mountains and is changing crews for the last leg of the journey inland. Waiting to take over is veteran driver Bernie Baker and his partner, Anthony Kears. <laughs> Morning. Morning. How are you, brother? Hey, good man. Had two on the last. She's bunched up. Brakes are just releasing there, so right. should be sweet. Bernie's a legend among the crews. He doesn't just drive trains, he collects them. And today, Mick has a present for him. Yeah, oh, cool. Oh, beautiful. We've been hanging out for that. Beauty, thanks, Mickey. See you, mate. Beautiful. It's a miniature of one of the other trains Bernie drives. Another one for his collection. Heading back to Dubbo. The nice little healthy 62 wagon empty container train. Some people coming out the wave. Bernie's a self-confessed train nut. <laughs> and has been since he can remember. All I wanted to do was finish school so I could join the railways. Uh, I was in my blood, see, because Dad was a driver. There. Some more photographers. Bernie's own train spotting adventures nearly cost him his life, trying to photograph a train from what he thought was a telephone pole. I monkeyed up the pole, like I always done. I stuck my neck up between the wires and got electrocuted. Spent two months in a coma and blew the leg off. So I lost, uh, lost my right leg there, the low knee. Yeah, woke up out of a coma, one sock too many. <laughs> What kind of a nut job chases trains and takes photos of it? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> the train is due to make it back to base in Dubbo late this evening to pick up thousands of tonnes of freight for the return journey. But at the Fletcher's home depot, 200 kilometres away... Hey, I've uh, just got a major breakdown, mate. Mmm, on my cotton packer. Things aren't running so smoothly. Operations manager Sean Magnuson has lost one of his conveyor belts that load the containers. We had a bit of a break in the um, end roller. The stub axles broke, torn off. Thanks, mate. This consignment of cotton seed has to be packed and locked into containers by the time Bernie's train arrives. The train can't be held up. These containers have to get to the docks in Sydney on time. We're, we're loading about 75 containers today in total. We've already got uh, about 120 already packed. If they're late, the ships will sail without them. I'll just sit it inside here. We'll make a new shaft and put new bearings on it and hopefully weld it all back together again and going by Nine o'clock, hopefully. Bernie's train is on its way, due to arrive in a few hours. If Sean can't fix the conveyor belt in time, this cotton seed won't be going anywhere. The drivers of 3MP9 
Cookie and Ryan have been warned there could be a flock of sheep on the line. You think if there was going to be any, they would have been at that level crossing back there. Yeah, that's what They've been scanning the horizon for signs of trouble, but can see nothing. So there's some out in the paddock here, but I can't see any around the track. We've just gone past the 49, so we obviously moved them. So we should be all right to pick up speed and go back to normal. Oh, yeah, control. We've just gone past about the 50 kilometre mark, and there's no sign of any sheep. Um, out here, so yeah, she's all clear. Cookie and Ryan's shift in the driving cabin is about to end. We've done well. We haven't hit anything. It's looking good. In each eight hour shift, the locos will travel more than 600 kilometres and burn through 6,000 litres of diesel. Having the driver relay means these trains can go virtually non-stop across the desert country. I'll drive for four hours and then Darren will take over for the next four. This train is heading into one of the loneliest places on earth. Not many people out here, that's for sure. Occasionally you see a few campers and a few four-wheel drivers, but not much else. Drivers joke about it being UFO country. But not long ago, the new driver, Phil, had an encounter that wasn't so funny. About midnight one night, and we went across through a, um, a cattle grate, and next thing a big light shone down from above us, lit up the whole area right across outside, the whole locomotive, and then it was gone. It was only there for a split second. It was almost like a helicopter line, but we looked out the window and there was no helicopters or anything. I don't believe in UFOs, but I can't explain what that was, so <laughs> it was an unidentified flying object. I keep it to myself. People think I'm nuts. Just over the Blue Mountains west of Sydney, the good run of Fletcher's drivers, Bernie and Anthony, has come to an end. Track controllers are holding them in a siding to make way for a passenger train to pass them on the single track section of the line. XBT. That's him now, just leaving Blaney now. Ooh. Time to break out the afternoon scones. This is great. <laughs> I've been on a diet until today, can you believe it? Crawling through the rolling hills again, Bernie gets to admire the full length of his 1.2 kilometre train. I'll see if I can get a look at the back of it. Oh, yeah. Back of your train's good. Very colourful, all those boxes, isn't it? Things aren't so relaxed at the Fletcher's depot in Dubbo. Oh, buddy, mate. Oh, buddy. Yeah, right, mate. We'll have it over at the workshop. Where operations manager Sean Magnuson is trying to get a broken cotton packing machine together again. If the conveyor belt isn't fixed in time, there'll be five less containers, holding 120 tonnes, nearly $40,000 of cotton seed bound for China that won't make it. But we'll take this over to the workshop. Are you right for the minute to do that? As night falls, the repair job continues. The pressure's on to fix the conveyor belt. The Savannah Lander is cruising towards its next stop. But Lee's gauges are telling him he has a problem. So I'm just noticing that the main, main air pressure is going between 100 and 125. It, it's uh, just dropping up and down a little bit as we're getting along. Air pressure is what powers the brakes. Lose it and the brakes will automatically lock on. So I was just wondering if we could hear any air leaking out anywhere. 
what tends to happen when you come up out of Forsyth, you've got a lot of really tight curves and can put a lot of um, pressure between the two units. Will gets the job to check it out. Can you go stand in between? Can you tell me if you can hear like one of the hoses leaking? Yeah. A slight hiss, but it may not be the air. When you throttle, it doesn't amplify it or anything. If you want to pull up and have a look at it, you can. Yeah, I might. The Savannah Lander makes its first unscheduled stop. Neither driver wants to take a risk out here. Uh, Lee's just got to go and check a, a hose pipe. There's just a little abnormality. There are no mechanics to call on. It's a problem they'll have to fix themselves. You can sort of hear a little hiss. Melbourne to Perth freighter 3MP9 is about to enter one of the world's biggest wildernesses. This is one of the last electronic signals its drivers will see. Yeah, because of the remoteness, there's no power out here to run signals. We're going to go underneath the Stewart Highway, which goes to Alice Springs. So once we go under that, that's the last major road we'll see until we get to about Kalgoorlie, which is uh, another 1,400 kilometres away. It's a single line for the next 1,000 kilometres, and it has to be shared. You'll uh, end up doing a double there at Cold Canopy. The MP7's right up um, MP9's clacker. The only place these super trains can pass is in sidings, just long enough to fit a 1.8 kilometre train. They're called crossing loops, and out here they serve another purpose. Drivers use them to check each other's trains for problems as they pass. You might see a door open or some ropes hanging down or something like that. MP9, you're all there complete. Right, uh, thanks for that. Uh, you're all complete to your flash not here. Thank you. After the crossing, it's time for a late night crew change in the middle of nowhere. Cookie and Ryan will do the graveyard shift. This next leg is unique. Perfect. Ahead of them is the longest straight stretch of railway line in the world. Well, we'll keep our maximum speed at 110. There'll be a few little dips and uh, little ups and downs, but other than that, it's just a straight track. 478 kilometres of dead straight track. On the other side of the continent, in New South Wales. When you hit him, you bagged his eye, you Bernie and his driving partner are looking out for stray animals that could wander onto the tracks at any time. Look out. Where's his mate? Uh, rock wallaby. Oh, sheep are the worst. They go underneath. They get tangled around all the traction motors, you know, that are on the axles, and they start to cook. Lucky for them, there's something cooking in the cab that smells good. Bernie's diet's about to take another hit. <laughs> In his perfect job, with the perfect dinner, it's moments like these Bernie relishes. Have a look at that, Anthony. Hey, we get paid big bucks for this. Bernie may be enjoying the ride, but at the depot, operations manager Sean Magnuson and his team are still frantically trying to fix the cotton loader. It's been down for four hours. They've managed to rebuild a broken shaft, but they need to fit it and get it working before Bernie's train arrives. Right, hold him there, hold him there. Yeah. 
It's been a tense race. Back him out and see if we can get him started. But when Sean fires up the loader again... Oh, she's up and running. It looks like they've won. Sweet ass, boys. Finally, they can load up the remaining cotton seed to make the next train out. So this box is now packed. We should be OK. You know, work together as one and we'll be right, we'll get it through. After a 500 kilometre journey up and over a notorious mountain range, Bernie's train has made it safely to the depot on time, ready to be loaded for a quick return to the docks tomorrow. We're here. It's been a long day. Shut them down, tie her up and go home. <laughs> but train lover Bernie can't wait to do it all over again. It is a bloody good job. It is really, really a good job. Deep in the outback, the Savannah Lander is still out of action. Lee is trying to find out why he has lost air pressure. You can sort of hear a little hiss. He hopes the culprit is a loose air hose. Just that's what you get to is a lot of, I don't know whether you can see, a little of dust builds up in the seals. So, um, Every now and then, that sort of creates a bit of an issue, so you just get in, clean it out. <laughs> it's hot, dusty work. But eventually, Lee discovers what's wrong. A latch that keeps the back door closed has been malfunctioning. There we go. It's powered by the train's air pressure system and is the reason for the unusual readings on his gauges. The back door wasn't quite latched. So, um, yeah, the little, little trip switch that goes on that, just letting go every now and then. And the Savannah Lander is soon back on track. Yeah, this is uh, Mount Surprise. Now, we've been told there's about 70-odd people that live here, but Lee and I have only ever met six. The passengers will stay the night in the local yeah. hotel, but Will and Lee have an after-work engagement. So, yeah, I mean, we were always happy to do something a, a bit different um, when the train pulls up. Out here, Will and Lee can always rely on an invitation for a get-together. But tonight's gathering down by the creek isn't what they expected. There's dogs on chairs. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> well, I figured we were coming out to help Doug do some, some sort of mustering or something like that. He's, he's pretty loose with his terms across the telephone. But uh, we got out here and he's, he's got some, some good friends of his uh, that are visiting. They've been sitting on the chair for 20 minutes. While cattle dogs on chairs might be a laugh, <laughs> what's lurking in a water trough is not. Believe it. Will. <laughs> Must have jumped in there out of the creek. Yeah, I've seen them in here from time to time, but. <laughs> After going non-stop through the night, Cookie and Ryan are across the Nullarbor, but still a day away from their destination of Perth. So far we've travelled about 750 k's, um, so during the night, which is a pretty good effort. Cookie has a present for the drivers of a train in a siding waiting for him to pass. Yeah, mate, um... Just past the location ahead, so do you want a paper? Yeah, we'll take paper, thanks very much. No. Yesterday's newspaper. It's not a very good roll up, but that'll do for them. If they want a paper, we'll throw one out. Oh, 
anyway, have a good trip, fellas. Twelve hours later, after running almost non-stop for two days, the train is back to civilization, having crossed the continent. Well, we've nearly travelled two and a half thousand k's, so yeah, we're looking forward to having a rest in a bed that doesn't move, and uh, yeah, we'll have a have a nice shower and rest up for the way back. I'm very tired. Looking forward to getting off. Behind the locos. 72 fully laden wagons that have been hauled across the country. To do the same by road would take more than a hundred trucks. Yeah, 5,664 tonnes of train from Melbourne to Perth arrived safely at Forestfield Depot. Melbourne to Perth, more than 3,000 kilometres. The end of one of the world's longest train journeys. That's it, shut them down and we'll go home. While the Savannah Lander is safely parked up for the night in Mount Surprise, Will. its drivers Will and Lee are risking it with one of the locals <laughs> at a nearby cattle station. The freshwater crocodile is trapped in a water trough. We'll get a rag or a something to throw on his head. You're gonna bounce. Freshwater crocs may be smaller than their saltwater cousins, but they can still pack a punch. <laughs> Thank goodness there are train drivers around. You got that part? Yeah, man. If I come round your way, so you can get out, or you come up, I'll go in, you go out. Look at that. Where's the deepest part of the creek here? Oh, down there, eh, probably? That way? Yeah. Here looks all right. Nice one. Yeah. Well, like so, if you want to sort of back off first, you're all right. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Go, 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 go. On this unique outback train, its drivers and passengers have crossed a mountain range, saved a fruit bat, given way to a kangaroo on a bridge crossing, and rescued a croc. And their journey is far from over. Next on Railroad Australia. There is a, a, a lot of pressure. Cane fires and cane trains. A race to the mill. And things can go wrong. That's why we've got to be on our game. Oh. Here we go. Bernie's brush with disaster. Whoa. And a hold-up on the Savannah Lander. We had a passenger last week, he got his head blown off. 